Hello, everyone. Welcome to another debrief episode of Channel 71 News. Today, we'll have our friend Amanda Kennedy on to talk about the event A Day Without Us happening tomorrow at 5 p.m. on the Common. Uh, but if you're watching this, it is today, Friday. Um, the event centered around abortion rights. We'll be talking to her about why that's important to attend. Um, we'll also be talking about the heated exchange that happened at the city council this week, as well as giving our takes on the recent master plan committee ward meeting. Uh, but with us, uh, we have, as always, Emily Spiria. Hello. Josh Kastorf. Hello, everyone. James Kukelis. Hello, everyone. And our recurring friend, Amanda Kennedy. Hi. So Amanda, tell us about this event that's happening tomorrow slash today um, and why it's important that we're having it. Okay, so um, we are hosting a pop-up of A Day Without Us. A Day Without Us is a national um, day, a national campaign um, being organized by a coalition of Black feminist organizations across the country. Um, we are just uh, marking that with them. Um, so we are, uh, we've are we created a space um, and are hoping people will come out and learn a little bit about reproductive justice and importantly, um, how reproductive justice connects to other social justice issues. So issues around racial equity, around housing justice, around um, queer and LGBT issues. Um, the goal of A Day Without Us is really to um, use a Black feminist framework to center and ground our activist work. And um, the coalition of folks who put, put the idea out there um, had uh, essentially like three goals um, for the day. A day without us, day without us is like really what they're hoping for is that women um, and allies, uh, uh, gender nonconforming folks um, across the country will withhold their labor um, uh, as our bodies are being regulated. So um, folks who are watching this maybe early on Friday, maybe call out uh, from work and participate by not participating in our economy. Um, so one part sort of labor strike, um, one part community building. So creating pop-up spaces where people in uh, your local community can meet um, other people who care about these issues and who are doing things. Um, I think the, the national organizers knew that a national framework would miss a lot of the variation that happens in different people's towns and um, that most of the work that needs to get done around reproductive justice is stuff that needs to happen in local spaces. Um, so part strike, part community building, and then part teach in. Um, so where possible, folks um, will be hosting these events and trying to give people good information and resources about reproductive justice. Um, for folks who can't make it to our event or who can't make it to any event wherever they are watching this, um, the Day Without Us website will be hosting um, teach in sort of elements and stuff, uh, live streaming all day. So you can um, even, I don't know, maybe extend your lunch break if you can't uh, strike the whole day, extend your lunch break and watch some stuff uh, on their website. Um, so uh, myself and a handful of other Waltham uh, folks had decided like we would also do this. And um, yeah, so that's why A Day Without Us, that's sort of what the, the people planning it hoped for the local areas to do. And um, we've sort of run with that. Um, we will have, uh, we hope to have kind of a family friendly experience for folks, bring your kids. Um, uh, we'll have like beverages and uh, I just got t-shirts in the mail from the national folks. So we'll have some t-shirts to give away and coupons for free Ben and Jerry's. Ben and Jerry's is like the one corporate uh, member of this sort of like uh, the sponsors of this uh, event. So they're providing ice creams if you want to come and get a treat. Um, and like I said, lots of um, uh, resources for people to gain access to and um, lots of different uh, people to meet um, and hopefully get kind of looped into stuff that's happening in Waltham. Well, it sounds like a great event. I'm definitely going to be there. Um, I hope other people are as well. Um, so what can folks expect when they come to this event? You know, it's like a good question. So um, I'll just be honest and say this is like my first time planning something like this. So we have a very loose framework. I think we really, we really wanted to just um, do the legwork of like 
picking a time and place for people to come together. Um, we will, we're embracing the, um, the teach in uh, element and the community building element. We chose to have the event at five because we knew a lot of folks would not be able to strike from their jobs. And so we wanted to create something that might maybe could catch people at the, the tail end of their day um, that will hopefully have a lot of like foot traffic and car traffic and stuff going by. So we'll be seen. Um, but we're embracing those like later, latter kind of two elements, the, the teach in peace and community building. So folks can expect to definitely meet people who are um, who care about the stuff and are doing uh, work in, um, in our area. In addition to planning this, the sort of group of us have been um, connecting with local abortion funds and um, putting together resources for to help other people get involved. So we'll be, um, you know, getting people copies of that information. Um, we hope to eventually host a fundraiser. And actually, I'll just say now we're looking for artists. If anyone wants, like, is artsy who watches this and wants to help us design some things um, to sell to fundraise for um, the Jane Fund and uh, Tides, which is a, a queer BIPOC led um, abortion fund, um, please get in touch somehow. Find me on Facebook or something. Um, so people can expect lots of information. Um, a, a handful of people, maybe more than I'm expecting, maybe not, um, will be saying things about reproductive justice or related justice issues. Um, I'll be talking about maternal mortality, which uh, is something that's really important to me um, and is uh, both sort of obviously related to reproduction, but also really tied into questions around abortion. Um, some folks will be talking about um, the, the way that abortion targets low income people um, and its relationship to like class struggle and capitalist uh, problems with capitalism. Um, I, I believe our little queer library folks will be there talking about some of the work that they do and the, the crossover between bodily autonomy as reproductive justice and bodily autonomy as trans rights. Um, so, uh, and then I think we're also gonna kind of open it up for folks if people who just attend wanna say some things, that would also be great. Um, so if you come, you know, and you're doing work on, it doesn't have to be abortion rights, but any anything that you think um, is sort of relevant, we'll kind of make space for that. Um, and then really just like meeting and greeting and hanging out, um, being in community with people to, find ways to cross pollinate ideas, I guess. Um, our group is, you know, really focused on uh, getting dealing with abortion funds and making sure that they are well funded um, and materially supported in lots of different ways. So if that interests people, maybe they want to join us. Um, but if people are really interested in like housing justice and um, class issues, maybe they meet the people who are working on those sorts of things and get kind of looped into that work. So um, we really hope people are coming to learn, but I also really hope that people come wanting to take another step beyond a day without us. So it really is just a starting point for people to um, find a way to get involved. I think um, this, this Roe v. Wade was a like a really big moment and I think it captured a lot of people's attention and that attention is beginning to wane, um, but it shouldn't be because things, this is a marathon. <laughs> like we need to be ready to like work for a long time on this. So um, even if it's small sorts of things that you can do, every little bit counts, every little bit helps. And the more people can get involved and stay involved and hopefully by bringing that community to them, um, and keeping it local, like, you know, you don't have to go to Boston, you don't have to go to DC and do, you know, the big women's march or something like you can do things that make a really significant impact um, materially in people's lives here in town, doing the things that, you know, with, with your neighbors, with your friends. Um, so I, I hope people will come and sort of feel what that could mean in, in the work that they do. Um, so people should also really care about uh, what's happening ongoing about abortion in the United States. Um, actually, I'll just quickly um, share a map uh, so that folks can see what has been happening. Please pardon uh, the number of tabs that I have open. I hope everybody else is that chaotic. But um, uh, on this map, you will see the sort of the ever-changing landscape of um, abortion access in the United States. Uh, the Black states are states where um, trigger bans or recent bans went into effect. So these are places where functionally abortion is illegal. Um, most recent additions to that are Arizona, which enacted 
reenacted reenacted um, a a ban from 1864. The red uh, states um, these are places with severely restricted abortion access. Uh, the coral states are um, states that have like technically it's legal but it's very uh, regulated. Um, and then the light pink and the whitish ones are are ones where it's still relatively protected. Um, although even those have caveats. I, I know I've said on this show before, um, like Massachusetts, we feel really good about our abortion access here. We have some really problematic restrictions on abortion uh, in the Commonwealth, for example. We do require um, youths to have parental permission, which is a really significant um, problem for young people in accessing their right to, the, you know, their human right of bodily autonomy. So, um, so I just wanted to pull this up. So folks who, who I think, you know, feel like, oh, maybe, maybe Roe v. Wade is gone, but like, I'm still fine. Um, this is really scary, a uh, scary looking map. Um, Republicans have also introduced uh, legislation that would, uh, this is not the first time, but they are reintroducing legislation that would uh, pass a federal ban on abortion. So, um, you know, there is, this is an ongoing thing um, and every day uh, it is um, changing and potentially getting worse. So um, so yeah, please please keep paying attention. Please um, don't let your, your anger uh, wane too much and please get involved. So that is really what we're hoping to spark um, tomorrow, Friday the 30th of September at 5 p.m. on the Common. Um, please uh, come and drink some cider with us and uh, I don't know, have a fun time. I don't know, make a sign, hang out, learn something. Well, thank you again, Amanda. Thank you. I just think that about how Cuba just passed the most progressive piece of legislation in human history. And meanwhile, America has descended further and further into this hellscape. And so moving on to the city council meeting, it was a very short meeting, very little actually happened. There were no communications from the mayor. Um, there were no special permit hearings, but what made it interesting um, was uh, George Darcy was declared out of order um, trying to submit a resolution, uh, which was very interesting. If you have the time to watch it, I would. What happened was George Darcy, the Ward 3 city councilor, submitted a resolution looking to create separated bike lanes on Lexington Street. The city clerk read the resolution and George gave a short speech about how the city owns enough land on one side of Lexington uh, that it's possible to create an ambitious plan to make biking to the current and new high school and for folks that use it to commute uh, to work, uh, not a death trap. Uh, it's very scary. It's almost impossible to do um, without you know, risking your life. Um, but immediately after he gave the speech, um, the Ward 1 City Councilor, Anthony Fossey, moved to have the resolution declared out of order because apparently George sent it to the council like, right before the meeting started. Um, he said he didn't have enough time to understand the resolution. Uh, honestly, I think this resolution is out of order. Um, the Councilor from Ward 3 states that he went to the Traffic Commission last Thursday and they presented to him that he should come to the council. We did not receive this resolution until 7.31 tonight as a late file communication. I was a member of that email that went out, but it didn't go through the clerk's office. It was from the councilor of Ward 3 to six other members of this council, four of which are all on the same board, which I believe this resolution should go to, which violates a couple of rules. And after a very heated discussion, um, the city council president agreed that George was too late and too, the whole process was too confusing and that he was ruled out of order and that he could resubmit it in two weeks. Now, to better understand that is to, is, is I would need to explain the etiquette of resolution submitting. The usual way a resolution is submitted is that it's sent out to, uh, to all the councilors, the, the maker of the resolution, emails it out to all the councilors, including the city clerk, um, and each councilor can decide if they want to sign on to the resolution. The day of the city council meeting, the city clerk reads the resolution aloud, and then anyone that is signed on to the resolution has a chance to speak about why they signed on. After all the councilors that have signed on had the opportunity to speak, uh, it's sent to committee, it's sent to a committee by the city council president. That's the end of the matter for the day. Nobody that hasn't signed on to it can speak on it, there's no debate, there's no voting. Uh, 
that nothing is done besides it being sent to committee. Um, in committee, the, the counselors argue about it. Anyone can really speak as long as uh, you know uh, they're allowed to. Um, and ultimately, that's where the fate of the resolution is decided. But the first day, all that's done is that it's introduced. The people that signed on have a chance to speak, and then it's sent to committee. Um, now, the practice of sending it to other counselors to sign on is a nice thing to do, and it's generally regarded as a way to do it, but it's not required. Um, there's many times a counselor will send it to the city clerk with only their name on it. Um, this usually is done when a counselor feels like it's their project and theirs alone. And also there's many instances of hubris uh, being involved, um, which we'll probably see very soon and I'll bring this up again. Um, and also and very important to the discussion is that resol a resolution is usually submitted between Monday and Wednesday because the docket of what is to be discussed is finalized on Thursday. But for orders, motions, and resolutions, um, they can be submitted late. They just end up becoming what's known as late file communications, and they don't appear on the docket for the city and the uh, public to know. It happens very often. It happens every other week. Uh, it's a normal thing that happens. It's very lacking in transparency. It's annoying. I've called for this to be out uh, to to be abolished. The late, the idea of a late file communication. Um, so George submitted this resolution very late. Uh, to the counselors that it uh, involves, uh, which is wards three, two, one, and six. Um, he signed it, he sent it all out uh, to them to sign on if they would like. Um, and Sean Durkee, the ward six city counselor did sign on. Uh, and the, uh, the city clerk got it and he read it aloud. He saw no issue uh, with it being super late. Um, but the Ward 1 City Councilor, who has never been a fan of George's, uh, moved to have the motion ruled out of order, and the City Council President agreed. Um, and I, you know, uh, I disagree with that decision. Um, George did nothing out of order. Um, late file communications exist, it happens all the time. And not to mention, George authored this resolution in 2019 and went through all the process of the City Council. And he was just at the Traffic Commission talking about this two weeks ago. Everyone knows what this resolution is. Everyone's aware of what it means. The Ward 1 City Councilor knows what it means. The City Council President knows what this means. And again, no one needs to understand every little detail of it because nothing happens on the first day. It's submitted, it's read aloud, it's sent to committee. In that committee, people can argue about it. What's say any, any opponent of the resolution can't do anything that first day. So it doesn't really matter what happens on that first day. Um, and again, City Clerk, Joe Vizard, saw no problem with it. Um, but I really wish George had submitted this earlier. It was really, really dumb for him to submit it so late. Um, and while I disagree that the city council president should have ruled it out of order, I can totally see how him being so late and a little confusing leaves him up to interpretations of Robert's rules that he could be declared out of order. It makes sense, you know, that's why it happened because you could argue that. Um, so George waits two weeks, it's really annoying. And it's one of those times, I see, I think this is the first time I've ever seen a resolution declared out of order. I've seen it attempted to be declared out of order, but I think this is the first time it's ever succeeded. And, and George is embarrassed and George waits two weeks. <laughs> When uh, Anthony Lefevre was commenting on it, it, it's usually only the people that have signed on to a resolution that comment right in that first round, and he hadn't signed on to it. So, it, it yeah, but he, was also... make, he was making a point of order, which anyone, ah, I see, I see. Yeah, yeah. Anyone's allowed to say that something is wrong. Yeah, he wasn't it's... saying that he disagreed with the resolution. It's... He was saying that he disagreed with how it was put in. Yeah. It's really unfortunate that when this thing runs on and selective enforcement of like the rules that you can't yeah. afford to be missing anything. Yeah, that's Robert's rules. Chris, do you think this has a this resolution could go somewhere once he resubmits it? Because that's kind of um, exciting. We don't have any. Yeah, yeah. Now, I mean, right? this. Yeah, I, I think this is just a pause. It's just wait two weeks and resubmit it. Um, I think there's uh, overwhelming public pressure uh, for this thing to occur, especially with what just happened at the ward meeting. Um, a couple of days ago, I think, you know, Sean Durkee signing on to the resolution, at uh, least credence to it. It's really only affects six, three, two, one, although every single city councilor can vote on this. So even if you don't live in any of those wards, when it does appear um, in two weeks, reaching out to your city councilor to say that you support this is very important. 
but yes, I do think I think it's viable. It's very ambitious. Um, I do think it's viable, and I think it's doable, and I think uh, it's going to happen. And for reference, what the resolution is seeking to do is just to get a feasibility study to look at his proposal. It's not just you know vote for separated bike lanes. It's vote to get the mayor to appropriate money to get a feasibility study to have an actual professional consulting firm look at what he's got and say how much it's actually going to cost. Yeah, I think the total ask was something on the order of like ten thousand dollars or something. Yeah, for that. yeah, I think it was. I think it was. He's guessing that it's going to cost ten thousand um, dollars, and he's probably right. What stood out to me the most was um, the was the heat itself in the exchange. Um, it was pretty unbridled, um, both between Lafosse and and Darcy and defensiveness a resolution can be submitted by one counselor it is definitely not out of order please sit it's counselor. definitely i'm not done yet i'm asking you to sit counselor. I, I it's a point of personal i'll give you a point that this will, is out of order this resolution is not out of me, order counselor, i've I, done my homework it's not out of order i will give you a point of personal privilege counselor the Continue. resolution is not out of order That's for me to decide. It's not for you to decide. It's for this body to decide. It as is they for the president of the city council to decide. You know, there could be subtext that we don't know between these two individuals, but it it was really damaging um, into getting any anything done, and that was really upsetting to me as a constituent. Um, it is, you know, this resolution's a good idea. Um, was it out of order I, I, based on what, um, you know, Chris has put forward? I think it's, it's, it's possible that said, I think it was absolutely unnecessary um, for, you know, LaFosse to um, point it out in this accusatory way um you know unless there's something we don't know you know but but i you know and, and the degree to which darcy was defensive you know this can still move forward and i think that um it damages the ability for our counselors to work together it damages um you know it puts kind of a taint on this resolution itself. Um, so I'm really disappointed in the counselors for uh, just absolutely acting like toddlers when they, you know, you can, you can point out that something's out of order um, and say, well, you know, this is what we need to do. And this is why we need to do it without absolutely breaking down and having a tantrum on, you know, by multiple parties. It was really really disappointing to see i was pretty bored it's worth pointing out too that there are reasons you don't want to be like have, for public meetings they are supposed to be filing these things so they're getting posted ahead of time so that people know what is going to be happening in the meeting but i mean now all of a sudden they care about that i guess okay so we'll have more on that in two weeks when george resubmits it I'll, uh it'll be interesting to see what happens um and finally uh just wanted to give um, everyone here the opportunity to share their thoughts on how the uh, master plan committee ward meeting went um, for the eight, nine uh, wards. Um, all of us were in attendance or watching. And uh, just a reminder that the five wards, five and six uh, are this coming Thursday at six o'clock at government center. Um, looking forward to that one as well. And also noting, I also want to note that the city didn't record it and Channel 71 News was the only one recording it. And which also leads me to believe that this might just be an election antic uh, with a, with the election season coming uh, soon. Because if they were serious about this master plan, they would record it. They would send out a mailer to every single resident of Waltham, which is not unheard of. That's not a radical opinion at all. Um, alerting them of these things. They would pay a consulting firm to do this professionally um, by, at the end with all the data they've accumulated um, from all the recordings that they should be doing. Um, and so 
I'm a, I'm a little concerned that this uh, they're not taking this seriously enough, but we're going to use it for all it's worth and um, definitely come out and make voices heard. Um, that being said, how did everyone feel about how it went? A lot of people voicing issues with the lack of like housing and the, the difficulty like affording living in the city and that people growing up in the city would then also not able to buy housing in the city, which was not, which is nice to see people bringing up. And also related to a lot of the things we've been covering with uh, marijuana uh, dispensaries, uh, one of the local business owners was uh, on from Pine Street in near Moody, uh, complaining that while it's zoned industrially because of the, the city's um, like, uh, keep outs for for recreation areas they can't actually operate there which is why all of the marijuana establishments are on bear hill road the bulk of what people spoke about fell into uh several categories but zoning at the end of the day is um the biggest overarching issue um you know if you look at the issues people were talking about um you know the big heading of pedestrian cyc and cyclist access and safety, um, you know, increased public transportation um, and sort of overlap with climate change, looking at housing, um, you know, and then either some, you know, other outlying, uh, not outlying issues, but other issues like looking at 200 Moody Street where the roofs collapse, et cetera. But so many issues relate to zoning in the city and what I would call overzoning. Um, and I, I think if we begin to look at um, the master plan or you know the existing state of affairs in Waltham through that lens and also look at what's going on in other uh, nearby cities and municipalities, um, it, it's quite interesting. You know, Boston and you know we were talking about just now James the cannabis establishments, we've mentioned before that um, Boston is looking at rolling back some of these, um, you know, these zoning requirements to make it more feasible in particular for um, social equity and economic empowerment um, applicants to be able to um, run a business. And um, end of the day, zoning. Zoning is what it's going to come down to. And Kathy Ann Harris, the counselor for Ward 8, had a really choice quote, which I think we can play for you. The other thing I heard tonight that wasn't said but was presented to me by a resident is to protect these single family neighborhoods from overdevelopment. As we think about creating housing, we also have to think about preserving what we have. And these neighborhoods are truly a treasure. Um, those, those you guys all, all live in them. Um, we don't want to see 15 houses knocked down and a big box put up. That would be absolutely devastating. Uh, no one else echoed that kind of sentiment, um, being so concerned for the single, single house neighborhoods. Um, but if we don't do something about the zoning in Waltham, the overzoning, we can't change anything. Uh, another concern I had was that um, in addition to that comment that um, Kathy Ann Harris made about protecting single family neighborhoods, um, former counselor Robert Logan uh, made a comment at some point about proposing changing zoning in favor of developers, but no one else. Um, so it's just something to keep an eye on um, that some of those on our city council and beyond um, are also very much still paying attention to zoning as an overarching issue. And they may be interested in changing it, but who are they interested in catering to? I agree. I think most of the issues really um, boil down to zoning um, that were talked about, and some people didn't mention zoning by name. Uh, I talked to us a lot about it on my campaign, um, but Somerville, when they realized that a lot of 
their development was hindered by the zoning of their city. It took them eight years from deciding to create a committee to even look at their zoning uh, to any change to their zoning. So while they really need to take this very seriously and very soon they need to admit something might be wrong in the city uh, in regards to zoning. And so I hope they, I hope this master plan illustrates that. Also, there's a contingent of people uh, voicing issues with the pedestrian infrastructure and lack of cycling infrastructure and protected cycling infrastructure as well. So, was yeah. Shout out, shout out to Critical Mass. I think of the 25 people that spoke, I think more than half were talking about pedestrianizing Moody Street and calling for more safe bike infrastructure. Um, it was a really good showing for uh, for that community all Southside residents, by the way. And we had some, you know, real, we had a great turnout from the Waltham Skate Park uh, contingent and including, you know, showing the appeal beyond just Waltham. We had a few um, young kids um, from nearby Newton who used the park and actually got up and I thought it was pretty brave. Really skateboarding is important to me and all of us. It's been a way for us to have a community in Waltham. Over quarantine, when everything was closed down, we would all go to the skate park. It was how I made friends. It was how I spent my days. I skated today. We all still skate, um, and we skate there every day. Waltham Skate Park isn't exactly like the best skate park. It's small. It's overcrowded. It has cracks. It's like over 20 years old. But the community there is still thriving, nonetheless. You know, it highlights when when the skaters are coming from Newton, which I think is great, but is it accessible to you know those in Waltham who want to use it? So there was some idea brought up about whether there might be some more decentralized smaller parks available. Um, and I think it just you know highlights the idea of accessibility in general in Waltham. So I was I was really happy that we heard more about that. I thought it, it, I was really impressed that I, I was concerned because they organized it by ward that people were only going to talk about really neighborhood specific things like pe too many people are parking here or too many people are using this one park or thing. But the, it seemed like the majority of people were there to talk about more of ideas that affect the whole city, like housing um, and the environment. And um, I also, I thought that was really cool that folks showed up about the skate park. Um, and I want to give a shout out to Brian Daly, who was on our show, who he and that community seem to have been really effective in spreading the word about this. And it's cool, not only because I hope they get a cool skate park out of it, but because that's how new people learn about and get involved in um, the city government and to have a bunch of young, new young people getting involved because of this is really cool. So that was, I, uh, I like that aspect of it too. One of the parents came from back to school night uh, partway through too, and um, specifically mentioned the dual language school and uh, in addition to pedestrianizing and improving access for, or, or uh, as, as a part of like a, a the rest of Waltham as a package basically and pointed to that as like a forward thinking investment that would like to see continue so that was that was also good to see there's a lively discussion about it on reddit too so i think that's a good aspect but regardless of how it ends up affecting the actual master plan it started some pretty robust discussions that Absolutely. need to happen so yeah i encourage people to check out the video and check out the Reddit discussion if you're interested and go to the next meeting if you're in one of those words. Okay, I think that uh, covers everything. Thank you uh, everyone for another good debrief episode and we'll be back next week. Thanks everyone. Take care. Bye everyone.